blow all. So this is our last video for theories of crime. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, critical criminology. So I gave you guys one example of critical criminology. Uh, it is uh, William Chambliss. He's one of the original critical criminologists. And uh, to get into thinking about what critical criminology is and how it works, I think it's important for us to back up and understand uh, what has happened with theories in sociology versus what has happened within theories of the subfield of criminology. Because uh, they kind of went in disparate directions. So in the 1960s, there was something called the conflict and consensus debate. Um, and so before that point, sociology has been predominantly dominated by uh, something called structural functionalism, uh, particularly a version of it called systems theory created by Talcott Parsons. And the baseline assumption of structural functionalism, which sort of viewed uh, viewed uh, so society as an organism and the pieces of it is somehow fitting together. Uh, this is very similar to like what we were looking at when we talked about Emil Durkheim. Um, the baseline assumption is that we generally agree within society. So, uh, so in other words, society grows out of an agreement or a consensus. Uh, this has its uh, uh, roots in, in the uh, uh, the sort of tradition that our political system grows out of in the Enlightenment, the contract theorists, who sort of claimed that uh, that in a general in some sort of distant past, government was formulated by everyone coming to a consensus to give up some of their power for other people, and since then there's been this sort of general consensus that's persisted through time. Um, in starting in the 60s, a lot of sociologists started to doubt uh, whether there were agreed upon norms and values within society. Instead, they wanted to think about society as sort of a battleground, a battleground between different groups. Uh, some of this conflict theory takes, uh, uh, takes the form of you know, looking at things like political powers or interest groups within society and how they interact with one another. Uh, some of the conflict theory takes more of the form, more more Marxist forms of looking at class inequality. We also get various forms of looking at race or gender. Uh, but all these models sort of assume uh, that society, rather than built upon some sort of agreement, is built upon frictions between groups of people. Uh, as well as domination towards right specific groups of people, so certain groups of people being taken advantage of. Um, so, like I said, sociology generally went in the direction of critical, uh, and it grew in a whole bunch of different ways. There's a whole series of theories that, to some degree, is incorporated with, within criminology as critical criminal. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, criminology generally went in consensus. There's a lot of uh, reasons why that happened, uh, some of which, which aren't as, uh, you know, aren't as, as good or things like that, you know, state funding often got attached to research in a different way, uh, particularly police departments generally paid for research from, uh, from criminologists, meaning that, like, you know, most Police departments don't really, you know, care about questions of, you know, whether laws are right or wrong or anything like that. Uh, so that's part of the reason. Part of the reason, too, uh, is that uh, you could argue that for certain, uh, depending on which, which crimes we're interested in studying, uh, some of them don't lend themselves very well to a critical, uh, critical uh, theoretical paradigm. So, uh, you know, somebody brought up in the post-murder, right? So, like, uh, arguably murder would be an example of one of these things that, like, you know, it's, like, what drives people to do it often. There's not really cultures where murder is generally acceptable. Uh, what makes people do it is often can be explained by these other paradigms better. And so, 
Uh, so soci uh, criminology sort of went off in its own direction. So sociology and criminology kind of become increasingly unaware of one another uh, and what they were doing theoretically. Uh, most sociologists aren't interested in, uh, don't know about things like, you know, like Travis Hershey uh, and you know, so, uh, social control theory. These aren't really things that are on people's minds in sociology. Likewise, most criminologists aren't particularly uh, well versed in the newer forms of sociology, things like post-structuralism. So, uh, so what conflict criminology has kind of done at various periods, once, in the, once you know, starting in the 1960s, uh, but increasingly so since the 1990s, uh, has attempted to create a conversation across uh, sociological theory and criminological theory, sort of bringing them closer together again. Um, and so if we want to really think of it as critical criminology is that voice of mainstream sociology within a very marginal subdiscipline of sociology criminology. Uh, marginal not in terms of its size or its importance, but like marginal as in like uh, it often became disconnected, right? Um, okay, so, so that's kind of the history of it. Uh, one of the things, and I brought this up before, um, we should really not think about theories in terms of like agree, disagree, like whether I as an individual agree or disagree with the theory is kind of a moot point. Um, so really like when we think about theory, we should think about it more as like you build up a series of different paradigms and then when you're explaining something, right, you can use them. Uh, so any of our philosophy, any of our, you know, theoretical paradigms that we've looked at in this course, you know, for de depending on what type of crime we're talking about, we're going to want to use different ones. Or what aspect of the criminal justice system we're talking about, we're going to want to use one or the other. Um, so uh, so there, and there are some things, whether, whether you're comfortable with it or not, there are some things that critical criminology discusses very well. Uh, and there are things that generally the other theories we've looked at don't. Um, and I'll give you some some uh, um, some examples. Uh, one example is that a lot of the inequalities within the criminal justice system are difficult to explain if you're not looking at them from a conflict model. Um, you know, why is it that you know that you know starting in the 1980s? Uh, that there becomes a disproportionately African-American population within the prison system. You know, it's a phenomenon called mass incarceration. Why does that happen? It's very hard to explain that with the other theories of crime. Uh, it's very easy to explain that if we think of it in terms of different groups of people challenging one another, vying for power, right? Uh, you, you essentially, you know, the laws, whether purposefully or not, represent the people who made them and predominantly in the United States. That means, you know, our political system represents the morals and ethics of sort of the white upper middle class, um, which doesn't necessarily line up with different classes and different races. Um, so we often make illegal or have negative perceptions of the crimes being committed by African Americans. Uh, we often police them more uh, than we do than we do white people. We often police poor people more than we do wealthy people. Uh, why is that? Uh, either you're left saying that you know, you know, basically you're either left having to say, claim that African Americans are more criminogenic, right? Like that they are more prone to crime, which is obviously racist, or you're, uh, or you're left having to explain it through a conflict perspective. Um, it also like some of the weird things that happen in our laws. Uh, so like, uh, like how do you explain something like I get a shorter prison sentence for murdering my wife because of crime of passion laws than you would for murdering a stranger on the street? Like that doesn't really make sense. Or, you know, why are the drugs used by, and somebody even cited this example in the, the why are the drugs used by poor people? Uh, why do they have longer prison sentences than others? And, you know, sort of a classic example of this is that crack in the 1980s had a large, longer prison sentence than cocaine. What is crack? It's cut cocaine. Who uses crack? Poor people. Who uses cocaine? Wealthy people. Or even things like, you know, often we will court and invite 
you know, war criminals that commit genocide into Western countries. Uh, yet, if you murder one person, uh, you know, you're you're you know often thought of in a very you know you have to you know we often want to if not execute the person, lock them up permanently. Um, and why is it that if I steal millions of dollars from my stockholders through inside trading? Uh, that that will often not even land you prison sentence, but yet you can easily go to prison for shoplifting. Um, you know, which one is really more harmful? And so critical criminology gets us into looking at questions of like, why are the laws written the way that they are? Uh, you know, questions about like, what does the law reflect? Where does it come from? Uh, and, and how do those things reflect power differences within our system? Um, and a lot of that's latent, you know, so like there are some critical criminologists who are going to look at it as like, no, you know, dominant, dominant, you know, groups definite, within our society definitely utilize the law in an attempt to oppress poor people or black people or women. You can also think about rape laws as a good, another great example of that, too. I didn't even put that into my notes, but, you know, uh, here you have literally the most common violent crime in America, uh, and it often has a much lighter sentence than other violent crimes. Why is that? Uh, I think you could arguably it's largely because it's committed against women. Um, so... So yeah, so so basically, critical criminology doesn't isn't stuck with just having to embrace the official definition of crime. Uh, it's the only theory we've looked at that's capable of sort of critically analyzing it. Uh, and like I said, for certain phenomena, like that is really useful. Uh, so if you're a criminologist who's interested in prison systems and how they work, critical criminology is the dominant form of that. Uh, the dominant framework at which you analyze prison systems. Uh, you know, if you're interested in, you know, issues of inequality, it is the go-to, obviously. If you're interested in drug policies, it's the go-to. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so a very interesting theory, one that's gained ground over the last 20 years uh, and is becoming you know, is if not has become, you know, if not reflected in the fact that, you know, this very standard textbook that you guys had has it as, you know, one of its chapters. It'll be at one of the later chapters. Uh, and it's, you know, it's been being used in, in criminology classrooms. It's a standard text for like 10, over 10 years. Uh, it's the one I tell criminology with. Um, so, uh, so you just sort of shows how central this has become over time. Uh, so in a lot of ways, we could argue that, that the critical uh, criminology has and continues to fulfill its goal, and that sociology and criminology have become, once again, a little more interlaced than they used to be. And it's largely the influence of, uh, uh, and you can feel whatever you want about that, but it's largely the influence of, uh, uh, of critical criminology. So. Um, so that kind of rounds out the, the last of our discussions. Uh, make sure that you get your final to me by May 7th at 1159. I won't be granting extensions. We have a short, you know, you, we have a turnaround. So like, you know, we have to get grades in. So make sure you get that to me. Uh, I've been granting a lot of extensions, uh, which also is part of the reason. Um, actually, no, sorry. I'm thinking of a different class. You guys turn papers to later. Do at the end of this week. Um, so yeah, you'll have next week to work on that final. Uh, and if you have any questions you want me to look over at beforehand, or if you're puzzled about a question, you, you, know, you can set up a time to call me, or you can email me. I'd be happy to have that. Otherwise, have a great summer, stay safe, and I will hopefully see you guys in the fall. Uh, have a great week. Bye.